Okay, Barbara, shall we, shall we start then? Sure. Okay. Uh, well, good afternoon, uh, and at least Indian time, and uh, good morning to Barbara. Uh, this is the sixth in our series of special lectures um, for 40 years of the center. It's a very difficult time to be organizing this event. We are in Delhi undergoing a, a massive surge uh, the, with the highest numbers ever. Um, our functioning as a center has been affected as a consequence. Um, so perhaps this strange medium that we are now a little more familiar with offers us at least some way of connecting across this uh, crisis ridden time. Um, we are very, very pleased to have uh, Barbara Harris White with us today. It's a privilege to have to be able to host her. Um, Barbara Harris White uh, drove from Cambridge to, to New Delhi in 1969 and was confronted by the Green Revolution in Punjab on the way and has studied and taught about India ever since in Cambridge University, in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and in Oxford University. Trained in agriculture and agricultural economics, she has worked in field economics, in political economy and in economic anthropology. She has worked in Tamil Nadu, West Bengal, and the mountains of Arunachal. She has mainstreamed gender relations in this field-based approach to knowledge. Her field research fields are one, agrarian transformations, agricultural markets, and the food economy. She has studied agricultural markets in Tamil Nadu over a 40-year period. And her book, uh, Rural Commercial Capitalism, explored the efficiency, extractive, and exploitative roles of markets over a quarter century's field research in West Bengal's agricultural markets and won the Edgar Graham Prize for Originality in Development Studies. Two, she has widened her focus to India's informal and criminal capitalism. Her book, India Working, which I think many of us are familiar with, published in 2003, synthesizes field knowledge about the social structure through which the informal economy is ordered. The Wild East, another enormously popular book in 2019, collects 11 case studies of criminal economy. It's open okay, access yeah. and I hear that it has 15,000 okay. downloads. Uh, Vanita, could you mute yourself? Uh, three, alongside these questions, she has also studied aspects of deprivation through field work, poverty, mal and undernutrition, gender subordination, disability, ill health, and alcoholism, educational deprivation, destitution, and its criminalization, aging, caste, tribe, and citizenship, and is now working on people who work in waste. She relates deprivation to the workings of capitalism, and Dalits and Adivasis in India's business economy is one outcome. Four, the economy as a waste-producing system where work started in 2011 and frames today's talk. Five, aspects of policy as social and political processes in all these fields. And six, the long-term study of a market town in South India, which has quadrupled in size from 1973 to 2013. A collective book on this small town called Middle India came out in 2016. She has advised UN agencies and the French and British governments, helped set up Oxford's MPhil in development studies, and what was at the time the world's first MSc in the study of contemporary India. She retired in 2011 to study the economy as a waste producing system and is currently exploring waste in the food system as a commissioner on the Global Food Systems Economic Commission. She is an Emeritus Professor in Development Studies in Oxford and Emeritus Fellow of Wolfson College. She is also a visiting professor in JNU. Uh, I now ask Barbara to begin her presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Mary John, and also Sundaresh, <clears throat> who is the IT communications wizard who makes this link, which is a miracle of technology, who makes it happen. First, I want to thank you for the introduction and congratulate the Center for Women's Development Studies for the first 40 years, which has been packed with important work, obviously punching 
above your weight, if that's not a masculine metaphor. <laughs> Work on the economy, um, women's rights, politics of, uh, of, of uh, discrimination and resistance, household and social reproduction and biological reproduction, the lived experience of women, their mental worlds, their socialization, their health, and women and conflicts. These are the things that spring out to somebody who's watching your center. And, and also that it has a vibrant student body, which has practical experience. So it's a tremendous achievement to have reached your 40 years. And I wish you all power for your next 40 years <clears throat> and immediately lots of safety and good health in which to carry on, carry on this work. Now, um, I would like to share a screen um, and I always get this wrong. Wait a moment, bear with me. Hang on. Can you see that? Yes, Barbara, it's, it's very clear. Yeah, we can hear. So, my title is Women and Waste and the Question of Shit Work. It's not my phrase. Um, it belonged to a paper published in Economic and Political Weekly in 1989. And I'll explain the origin of this phrase. <clears throat> but first, I want to thank Gilbert Rodrigo and an NGO in Tamil Nadu, because without them, I would never have been able to do the fieldwork I'm going to talk about. OK, so where did this concept come from? Um, in 1989, uh, Patricia and Roger Jeffrey, um, working on a village they've studied for decades and decades, all their adult life, in rural Uttar Pradesh, wrote a paper about cow dung. Um, and this is where this term of shit work first appeared in print, applied to waste. But their focus was cow dung as a form of waste, as waste from milk and from the traction that cows and bullocks put into agricultural production. And they saw it in the village as completely women's work, <clears throat> a huge amount of work, which if you managed to impute it at what they guessed were market prices, might have added up to half a year's agricultural wage, uh, agricultural income. So completely unvalued work which um, produced cow dung patties, which were used for fuel, um, which are, cow dung is used for fertilizer, organic manure. It's also a sealing agent and sometimes mixed with urine or water for cleaning, and it can be used as an insecticide. So they saw this invisible women's work as enormously important to the rural economy, and it enabled them to reflect on some of the binaries that we use in development studies, because this work quite obviously straddled productive work and also reproductive work. So they had a straddling category in dung work. They also called it shit work. And by that they meant work which is of low status, menial work, that means um, um, uh, simple manual work, but manual work um, with no prestige and work which has no control over resources. <clears throat> and they showed that it was undervalued. Indeed, when men in the village were consulted about it, they laughed, they uh, disregarded it completely. It was undervalued both by men and by everybody who was privatizing and encroaching common property resources, which actually provide the fodder for the cattle, which produce the dung. Now I want to <clears throat> fast forward in an outrageous way, really, to 2015, when I started working on um, solid and liquid waste, having worked on gaseous waste in agriculture before that. And I want to fast forward from the north to the south, from UP to Tamilad, and from a village to a town to look at urban waste. And instead of it being uncommodified 
um, invisible work by women, it's a very obvious public sector of the local municipal government, and it's also privately commodified. It's a highly differentiated, commodified, semi-commodified system, which is very poorly understood by the, the officials in the municipality in the four municipal departments which share the responsibility for it. And I'm going to argue that it is structurally, necessarily informalized. And here, it isn't women's work, it is women's work, but it's also men's work. So I'm moving from a study specifically of women's work in 1989 to the gendered work of the waste economy now. Um, waste is a very strange field. It, it has grown enormously rapidly as an academic field as the quantitative significance of Indian waste has grown and grown and is completely unavoidable now. Um, waste is probably the fastest growing sector, although the official data for waste are not, not very reliable. Um, we tend to look at consumption waste, but the statistics suggest that a third of India's waste comes from agriculture, a third from industry, and only a third is the consumption waste that all of us see every day in India. Um, a team led by Hoonveig produced a paper in Nature in 2013, which predicted that peak waste, which is the moment beyond which the total output of waste might decline because of efficiency in the production of waste, that date is 100 years into the future. Well, it's now 90 years into the future, but it's a hell of a long way off. <clears throat> and between now and then, um, waste is expected to grow, to do nothing but grow in absolute terms. So I started with waste as a neglected um, development problem. It's one that's going to get much worse. Um, there is a growing subfield of waste expertise. Um, the moment you start reading in the literature on waste, you realize that it's epistemologically incoherent, that the various government departments responsible for waste actually classify it, they think about it, and they act on it according to different kinds of labeling. And that is true um, at all scales of government, <clears throat> and it's true inside local government, which is the front line of the public sector against waste, that different departments conceive what waste is and classify it in different ways, not to mention the ways academics classify it, and then waste workers themselves who are actually doing the work. So we have a field um, which is characterized by incoherence in how we understand what it is. And this is the kind of scene um, that made me interested in studying waste. Small town, every verge, every river um, course, every drain around every telegraph pole, every spare bit of land, no matter what its tenure, um, the middle center left will be privately owned land and um, all wasteland in the town covered in waste. Um, if, if you visit India, as I do, for field work every so often, you see this buildup of waste in a very dramatic way. And in the end, I thought, I have to stop studying food and start studying this. Now, the waste literature, and I am very happy to share what I know about it with people who are interested afterwards. It has a number of thematic focuses. I was talking with Professor John before this, lecture began on manual scavenging, and that has certainly been one of them, including the big Human Rights Watch report of 2014. But there are other focuses, and they tend to be, um, they, they tend to be idiosyncratic. So Kaveri Gill worked on plastic waste, and that is a subfield. Other people work on ship breaking, or the problems of e-waste. Um, if you get my drift, waste is kind of carved up in various thematic ways. 
um, work in Hyderabad has uh, taken waste in another way, my street, the sociology of waste on a given street or a quarter of town, like leatherworking quarter, a ward in which there's a cluster of leatherworking um, enterprises and the production and disposal of the waste that's produced there. So in so far as the field of waste is epistemologically coher incoherent and it's thematically quite focused, what it means is that there are many lacunae, there are many um, aspects of, of waste which are not studied very much at all. So I decided to study small town waste to fill this gap or to start filling this gap because the work is exploratory and because I was interested in the 19th century debates between Justus von Liebig and Engels and Marx on the metabolic rift in agriculture and their observation, which was hard to avoid, just as it is hard to avoid in India now, observation of Western Europe, that agricultural production took nutrients from the soil, delivered them in the form of um, food to towns, um, and the waste from that process was thrown into rivers and never went back to the soil. And that rift in the cycle of resources is what they call the metabolic rift. And they applied that, and the metaphor of town and country can now be applied to the world. We're in the middle of massive and very complicated metabolic rift. And so I thought, let's study a town. So it was overdetermined. And uh, by the end of the first week of exploratory research, I had picked on a heuristic, a sort of framework which made sense of small town waste. Because what I discovered was that the waste that we can see that was on the previous slide, this waste, is only a small part of the waste produced by the town. So I decided to study it um, through the circuits of capital. So I was looking at the question, <clears throat> how is waste produced in the sphere of production in the town? How is waste produced and, and disposed of in the sphere of distribution in the town? In consumption, which is the obvious one. In the production of human labor, which is our manual scavenging, the problem of human feces. Um, and then in the social reproduction, in the reproduction of society, that is the reproduction of class society. Um, and I will explain as I go um, how I did this because I couldn't study a town completely. Um, I studied it through case material. So I found cases of the way in which waste is produced in these various circuits of capital. Um, and I am telling stories really. I'm not trying to generalize, but I'm trying to convey what I found through these case studies. I started the case studies in 2015. In 2016, I continued and I studied officials in the municipality and their responsibility and knowledge of the waste economy. That's the nearest I got to policy. Um, and then in 2019, along with Advaita Rajendra, who's doing a PhD at IIM Ahmedabad, working on waste, we both in our case study towns studied the skills that are involved in waste, because most people feel that waste is a totally hopeless field in which the people involved have no skills whatsoever, try and do it. <clears throat> so uh, I shall be talking about um, what I discovered about women and men in this waste economy through these case studies. And I'm going to follow the same method as the Jeffreys did in their village um, research in 1989. So I'm going to focus on substances and the organization of tasks. Unlike them, I'm going to talk about commodification and earnings because it's no longer um, an unvalued work. And then unlike them, not just talk about women, but women, men relations at work. And finally talk about um, their visibility in social and political terms and the question of collective action. So that's the, um, that's the outline of the talk that I'm going to, going to give you, going to develop. Okay, so in this town, um, the waste that's pr 
produced in industrial production is mainly in agro-industrial production. And the take home um, message is that this work is disproportionately Dalit. Now the town had a liquor factory and the top left photograph is part of the effluent from a liquor factory. In fact, because of the destructive nature of this effluent, which had destroyed the lands of Dalit farmers, this factory had been closed because it, it was producing a completely toxic effluent. Um, so until very recently, uh, the, the big polluter was the liquor factory and the uh, labor force that was involved in cleaning it and disposing of waste was disproportionately Dalit. But what was around when I did my field work was the rice mills. Now we don't think of rice mills as producers of waste, but if you look at the diagonal heaps in this slide, you'll see that um, semi-burnt husk and husk is piled up all around these factory compounds, which have become more and more capital biased since over the decades that I've been studying them. Okay, so how does it work in rice mills and um, the co commodified means of subsistence. So the town I studied, which I'm going to leave anonymous, has a ring of mills. And the waste from rice milling is theoretically biodegradable and recyclable. It consists of husk, which can be used as a fuel and burnt husk can technically be used as fertilizer. It consists of bran, which is a raw material for solvent oil extraction used for things like paint and broken rice can either be milled to flour or bagged for chicken food feed um, animal feed um, so on the face of it it looks as though there isn't very much waste but all this waste has to be um, prepared all these byproducts have to be prepared to be thrown out or recycled and the waste work in the rice mills in this town is of a very particular kind. Um, it's, it's done by casual labor, migrants who are often bonded and who don't speak the local language. So that's why I call them gagged and bound. Um, they're bonded by loans and they're gagged by their language, their lack of language and um, their Dalit and tribal Labors, laborers very distinctively. And the technical change that is producing these highly capitalized rice mills, very different from when I started in the 70s, um, it, it doesn't uh, displace the costliest labor, which is what it would displace in economic theory. It actually displaces the cheapest labor, which is this casual female labor. And the tribal women who do the sweeping and the cleaning and who um, push the waste into public space from the com compounds of these mills are getting about three rupees a month. And so one of the messages coming through is that there's extreme gender differentiation in the earnings of women and male sweepers and cleaners in rice mills. The Dalit men get about twice as much. Um, in terms of their political visibility, this labor is pretty invisible. And not only, however, it's not quite invisible because um, when you start talking to these people, they immediately talk about the relationship between their wages and the costs of living of their families and how dependent they are on the public distribution system. So this is an era in which there's a lot of criticism of the public distribution system, but one of the main take home points of this field work has been how important it is to people at the bottom of the social pile who are dealing with, dealing with waste. Okay, so that was production. Let's look at distribution in this town. So I looked at distribution in a very kind of boneheaded literal way and looked at Indian railways distributing people. And then I looked at distribution in terms of an economic sense of distribution. And I looked at a market for the market for vegetables and fruit in the town, having studied 
cereals all my life. I thought, let's change things. Um, so first, what do we learn from Indian railways? Well, the photographs tell a story in their own right. The station is spick and span and look at the state of the track. Um, there, the station comes under <clears throat> one department of Indian Railways and the track comes under another. Um, if you look at the left-hand picture and the middle picture, you'll see one of my themes, which is that the, the, the female labor works alone um, in their formal day job, but they group together after work, the middle photograph, um, to segregate what they find and to sell it privately to a bulking wholesaler in the town. So they're literally working on shit on the, on the tracks. Um, and they're also collecting general consumption waste um, in the station. Okay, what do we learn? Even educated people use the station as a dustbin and as for the tracks, just don't go there. Although I'm pleased to say I did walk along the tracks at one stage. Um, one thing we found which is of general relevance is, is that waste falls between the cracks. It doesn't just fall onto the tracks. It's the responsibility of several sub-departments inside Indian Railways. So the, the line is the responsibility of engineers who sometimes put lime onto the line to, to try to do something about the shit. And the, at the station, waste comes under food standards and it comes under public health. So there are specialized officials sitting at the station um, working in different aspects of the waste that is generated at the station. Um, and that kind of lack of coordination <clears throat> is common in the architecture or the bureaucratic architecture of waste at all scales of government. Um, the next thing we learned from Indian Railways is something else which um, applies to many complex organizations that have been um, run fully by the state. So we learned that in 2008, Indian Railways started a dramatic privatization of cleaning labor. And we can discuss privatization and um, contractualization from many perspectives, but from the perspective of the labor involved, this was a massive pay crash for women Dalit laborers and their earnings crashed from about 15,000 a month to 5,000 a month. So um, they were laid off and they were rehired by private companies and they're supervised by men. So most of the frontline work um, on ra of railway cleaning is done by women. And given the huge nosedive in their take home pay, not to mention the lack of work rights and benefits after privatization, these women were forced into after shift shifts. So in a classic way, the working day had to be lengthened. And if they did this work segregating the usual, the usual sectors, paper, card, plastic, metals, and glass, if they did that work, they might get two or 3,000 rupees more to their earnings. So that didn't actually bring their earnings up to pre-privatization, but it enabled families to survive. And this story is the same for colleges, hospitals, all kinds of departments of government. Um, and uh, so we learn something from Indian Railways, which is quite widely relevant. And politically, they become invisibilized. If they were unionized, they're de-unionized. It's impossible to organize them. How can you organize people who are doing 12 hours a day work? Very, very difficult. I think many of the people in this audience know just how hard it is. Okay. If we turn to the other economic sense of distribution, my case study was the vegetable market. And what I discovered is that the town produces truly enormous quantities of food waste and biodegradable waste, far too much for the municipal labor force to cope with. So that waste is either fly tipped or it acts as a raw material for a, an enormous 
um, back street, um, petty commodity producing, dairying and livestock industry. And here we have some images of a working family, mostly working women, and they're working, but they're very, very far from public space. They're down um, corridors and alleys in deep inside their homes um, with little stables at the back. Okay, so while we have um, 13 veg vegetable and fruit wholesalers who are licensed and registered, and we have meals hotels in the towns, Sarbarda, which are registered, the main fruit and vegetable meat and fish markets are not registered and they're not regulated and they are massive waste generators. Um, so, as I said it, when I spoke to the photographs, the raw material, which is food waste, along with commercialized husk, not just from rice mills, but dal mills, oil mills in the back streets of the town, and unwanted PDS rice are used as fodder for these small scale urban dairies, family operated urban dairies for the small livestock that line every alley of the back streets of the town and for thousands of pigs. There are about a thousand pigs reared in compounds in the town and another thousand owned by people in the town um, grazing the wasteland and the forest land around the town. So that was a surprise to me and I learned that 5% of the town eat pork and that pork was being sent in large quantities for the tourist industry in Chennai and along the coast in Tamil Nadu. So it's a much more serious kind of industry than um, we think it is. So there is a division of labor in this family dairying. <clears throat> Most of the commodified work is male, the delivery of the milk, the sale of milk, the collection of bottles, but the cleaning of bottles and the rearing of cattle and milking of cattle and the management of credit are female tasks. Uh, Isabelle Guerin and her team in the Institut Francais in Pondicherry have done a huge amount of work on the responsibility of women for very complex credit juggling inside the household. And this was a case in point. The home is the work site. All this work on cattle rearing brings in very, very small income, only about 2,000 rupees a month. And so these petty family dairies are dependent on intra-household cross subsidies. You might ask, why do people do it at all? I think they like it. Um, I think they like to do this work. And I'd be very interested to know of other reasons why a family would work so hard at milk production and only net about 2,000 rupees a month. And I think that's a fairly robust, that was my calculation, but I've triangulated it with other people who've studied small scale dairying. And I think that's reasonable. It has to be part-time work that's consistent with other kinds of income earning, which make these households viable. On their visibility, um, they actually, they strive very hard to be invisible. They, they want to invade inspection and uh, political visibility. While they're proud of the quality of their milk, they want to evade um, the politics of adulteration. So they don't brand their milk, they don't have any insurance and they have no collective representation. So you have women at the heart of family business, which is much more common in the back streets of the town than I had ever imagined. Now we come to the labor aristocracy, um, consumption waste, those photographs I showed you right at the start, which um, have become more and more pressing to study over the last 20 years. And I spoke to the leaders of uh, the situ branch of women's, the women's municipal sanitation worker section and this is a photo of their living quarters, which are a bit dilapidated, but not as bad as some I'm going to show you later. So th these ladies are um, well-trained by the union and they are articulate 
angry, um, very impressive people. And what they have to tell me over the five years that I was studying them is as follows. There's been a huge change over the last 10 years in the composition of waste. Over time, and since I've started doing fieldwork in 1973 in the town of Arni, most of the urban waste was biodegradable and it was composted in big pits around the edge of town. Over the last 10 years, the amount of non-biodegradable urban waste has vastly exceeded biodegradable waste. And it comes under the responsibility of the municipality. So it's a public service and it's funded from property and professional taxes. And it's a budget item which is capped at 49% of the total budget. At first I thought that was an all India cap, but I don't think it is. I think other municipalities elsewhere don't have this cap. Um, at the beginning of the 21st century, there was a workforce of 250 municipal sanitation workers on grade four of um, the bureaucratic pay scale. Now there are under half of that, 115. While meanwhile, the increase in waste has, has expanded at least fourfold. Nobody really knows how much, but it just goes on expanding and expanding. And an economist would say, well, that doesn't matter if they've been um, allowed to mechanize waste disposal. And it's true that there are tractors and trailers and there are crushing lorries. Um, where in 2000 there would just have been bikes and bike carts. But the expansion in waste has definitely not been compensated through increased productivity and mechanization. So it's just an impossible um, equation, an equation which doesn't work at all. 115 people cannot deal with the waste of this town. So um, bit by bit, and without the sort of big bang of Indian railways and colleges, um, there has been a tendency towards incremental privatization, masculinization, and ad hoc contracts. Um, the work teams are teams of three, two women and one men, ideally, and the pay is equal for men and women, but it has been declining and it's possible to do this because of ad hoc and not permanent or regular contracts. So while I've been doing field work, the average wage has gone down from 15 rupees, 1000 rupees a month to 12,000 with benefits. So this is why we might call them an aristocracy. They do dreadful work, but they have full work benefits in theory. Um, in 2015, I met people who were earning 20,000 rupees a month, but they have retired. Um, it takes them two years to get hold of their pensions, and the people who are left are not paid um, anything like as much as the labor force was even five, six years ago. And the benefits are often accompanied by exclusions. For instance, sick benefit. Um, uh, very discriminatory treatment in the hospital, pensions and maternity benefits, lots of delays in the provision of the money. They also have equipment, but it's not always appropriate. Um, all the way from brooms, which are not the right shape for the work that they do and which break, galoshes which collapse, trucks which are ecological and electric but which are small so small that the team of three can't actually sit on them properly and the load that they carry means that the journey to the dump yard has to be done twice for the volume of waste that used to take one journey which adds colossally to the daily work so it looks fine but in fact it's creating um, new problems which weren't there before while the waste just goes on um, expanding and expanding. So what is happening is that the aristocracy, uh, the terms and conditions of their work are deteriorating and their working day is lengthening, not formally, but the workforce knows that they can't get that work done unless they work for much longer shifts. And then the municipality has permitted the uh, 
municipal sanitation labor force to sell the recyclable waste that they collect. The previously, they didn't sell it. And there was um, an accommodation with informal labor, which um, swept the town and picked out recyclable raw material um, alongside the municipal sanitation labor force, whose job was to tip it into the dump yard. So now they are encroaching onto the territory of informal labor and competition is replacing the kind of cooperative relations that the municipal labor force had with the informal labor force. Shockingly, there is no changing room, there are no lavatories, there are no facilities for this labor force. And what this means is that the um, only part of the municipal, uh, of the waste economy where decent wages are being earned um, have to practice a very tight control over bodily functions. And mainly they don't eat and they don't even drink until after the first shift. In other words, they might have a cup of coffee when they wake, wake but they have nothing to eat or drink until after midday. Um, so people who are spending their whole lives like this um, are vulnerable to occupation related diseases, urinary tract infections, and so on and so forth. Now, you might think that this, since the waste that they deal with is the waste that we see, that they will be politically visible, but they aren't. They're treated with utter contempt by the um, bureaucracy, the local officials who <clears throat> are nominally in charge of waste. They are not consulted. The officials don't know the streets where they work. They never consult this labor force about problems that they might be facing. It's a top-down relationship if there's a relationship at all. The trade union gives them training and they're very impressive as a result of this training. But in the general um, political maelstrom of C2 activity, waste is actually very low priority. So they're less visible than you might think. Okay, alongside the municipal labor force, there is a private wholesale hierarchy of recyclable raw materials gathered um, from the streets um, under a variety of labor arrangements, self-employment, that's SE at the top, family labor, and also wage labor. And women are really important in this work, particularly in segregating. Um, the town has a network of male wholesalers who are bulking <clears throat> the pickings and the segregated raw material that informal waste gatherers collect. And this is dominated by a caste called the Nadas, who have been upwardly mobile for the last 50, 60 years in Tamil Nadu, and it is exclusively Nada. And the people who control the Seven Acre Scrapyard, which is the Apex organization, are a very rich Nada family, as well as the people who control gunny bags and all kinds of other aspects of the bulking of waste. And they are supplied by this informal, large, unknown number of collectors and segregators, plus all the cleaning labor in the schools and colleges and office complexes, the stations for buses and trains and the hospitals which are exploiting themselves after shifts by, um, and this is new, by uh, not simply um, allowing informal segregators to pick over what they collect, but doing it themselves and segregating it themselves and selling it themselves after the shift. The Apex Scrapyard em employs um, men and women, more women than men. The women are local, backward caste or scheduled caste women, and the men are all long distant migrants who again have a problem with language and they sit there in parallel lines, cleaning and segregating and packing. And at the apex scrapyard, they're distinguishing up to 200 raw materials. We've watched the work. It's, you have to be very nimble. You have to be able to do this sitting in one place for long hours, nine hours a day, six days a week. But the women we spoke to, local women, have an alternative, which is agricultural labor. And we were surprised to see that for them, this work, low caste women um, is a liberation 
because they get casual wages, but they get what they call them regular casual wages, not seasonal casual wages as they might get in agriculture. So there is a gender gap, about 4,800 a month for women and 7,200 a month for men. And it's jolly hard work. You don't age gracefully. Um, right. And so you've got the municipal labour force, you've got the informal labour force and the bulkers and their wage labour force. And then the municipality has been forced to auction off more and more of the wards of the town to private companies, which reckon they can do it at less cost than the municipality pays out for direct employment. And they can only do that if the wage at work uh, at the expense of the, of, of the wage and the earnings of labor. So you have a series of more or less successful private companies um, which have bid successfully for parts of the town and do manage this work through primitive technology, through migrant bonded labor. And look at the bottom right picture, not at the nice cement house in the background, but the shacks um, surrounding it and coming towards the front. This is where this labor lives in absolute some conditions without any infrastructure, except for satellite television. Um, so at present, a third of the streets are auctioned off to private bidders. They undercut the public budget because of paying the labor 8,000 a month instead of 15 or 12. And that labor, of course, doesn't have any rights and has to supplement the 8,000 with after shift, informal work, segregating, cleaning, and so on and so forth. So they are also invisible politically and socially. They have no local languages, no organization, and yet their work is completely essential to the survival of the urban economy. Okay, the last aspect of consumption waste is the dumpyard. Here are some images of the life living conditions of the people who work on the dump yard. And you can see the most exiguous of straw tents and shacks. Um, there's a, a camp um, middle right, which um, workers have left. They were going on a pilgrimage. They just left this mass of plastic and straw, which is how they live. Um, and their work environment is the dump yard. Um, the, uh, the, the top left picture is a rural dump yard on which the cattle are grazing. I gather they graze with great discrimination. And the other pictures are the urban dump yard for the town. And there are families who live by combing over the burning surface of the dump yard. It's not in their interest to burn the surface, but it compacts the waste, which is already about to twice or thrice higher than the restraining walls. This is their world. And here they are, they work in couples, in families, in small gangs, sometimes women by themselves as in the top right and in various groups. They're also um, treated with contempt by other workers in the waste economy. And several people shocked me by saying, well, they're not really fully like us. They're not really fully human. Um, they used to be allowed to sweep the town at dawn before the municipal sanitation work got going. Um, and that provided them with a guaranteed income of raw material. However, the stresses to public finance because of local tax evasion have stopped this. And now it's the sanitation workforce who collect the recyclables and displace the schedule tribal self-employed labor. And the municipality has given them one slummy ward free so that they can work there. So there is some recognition that they exist. Um, and what, who are they? They are transients. They present themselves as transient, but they're really permanent transients. <clears throat> that the Irulas have been multiply evicted from their work routes and from their living spaces. They don't have um, land rights to their homes. So they live in wooden or Palmyra thatch um, 
huts. They have an oral culture. I was told that their Tamil is not vulgar. It's very distinctive, but it's not vulgar. They have a rich oral culture, no education. So they say we are easily fooled. Um, they're often bonded not just by loans, but by bikes and by trailers. They're bonded by equipment to certain dealers and the prices at which they sell the raw material that they gather are about half that of the prices that non-bonded gatherers get from other wholesalers. They work collectively in small groups for protection and they get between three and 4,000 rupees a month from it. And they can't possibly live on that kind of income for a household. So they do Kalyana Mandapam work, they clean up wedding halls, they work in brickworks. If there are brickworks, they do that kind of work. They used to fish, um, they can't because there's no water in the river for fish to live in. <coughs> They are visible in the sense that they're, they're negative, they're not invisible. They're actively expelled and treated very brutally by the state. They don't have certificates of scheduled tribal status. They have very poor distribution of ration cards, which they share. And they're regarded by other waste workers as, as I said, not human. And I'd love to know from you why you think some people are actually being dehumanized. I could only think that they, they have various characteristics, like being dependent on alcohol, um, like relatively high status of women, like being illiterate, like living in forests and having a detailed knowledge of the forests. Um, that individual scheduled tribes and scheduled castes also have, but they have it as a, a package, as it were. They have a whole set of attributes that are stigmatizing together. But I have no better reason than that, and I wish somebody could tell me why this is. Anyway, they are abjectly dependent on Enrego, which they can only do through intermediaries who have big hearts and call them for Enrego work because they have such a frosty relation with the local state, and they're abjectly dependent on the public distribution system and on begging. Okay, now our waste, the real shit. Um, waste in the production of labor. As you all know, manual scavenging was abolished in the early 1990s and the uh, bureaucratic category has been de-reserved and people no longer inherit these jobs, which means that the ad hoc jobs working in, um, in cleaning shit depend on patronage, but not just cleaning shit. It's now just part of consumption waste. It's, be, it's been sort of reorganized in the waste economy. Half the town has septic tanks, um, but these septic tanks have been built to incorrect specifications, often poor quality cement and often much smaller than they should be. And people tend not to um, have them voided or cleaned um, every one or two years as they should, but it's more like every one or two generations or when a wedding is about to happen or when they clog up completely. Um, so there used to be a public service of septic tankers, um, but that has been privatized as well. And the private septic tanker businesses, which are all owned by um, Pariyars or Arundhatiyars, um, scheduled castes or scheduled tribes, um, are, are uh, complain that their services are under underutilized. However, even if you do, as in the photograph, get your septic tank voided, there is no treatment center for fecal sludge. And so it is dumped in a neri, in a, what used to be an irrigation tank, which is now totally toxified. And there is, it's only possible because there is a relationship between the police. You clean our septic tanks for free, we fine you, um, and then you're allowed to dump this sludge in the local yiri, in the local lake. Um, so that's how it works and it's unsustainable. They also, I, I saw an advertisement in the municipality 
showing um, how to drain your septic tank into through a wall into an open drain. So it's something that the local government actually encourages. And if you move around town, you see compound walls um, uh, penetrated by drains from lavatories into the open drains outside the gullies of the inner part of the town. So many of the septic tanks drain into open drains, which are crammed with general consumption waste. And then I quote from one of the two ladies you saw, more and more waste is complicated, horrible and jumbled up in the drains. It is new, not just shit, but also sanitary napkins, tampons and incontinence pads muddled up with used plastic, glass, metals, paper, cardboard, and food waste. Now, just think about the idea that quite a lot of this consumption waste is recyclable. And then think about it being coated in the materials that come from this much more complicated human waste. It, it, it simply isn't just a matter of feces anymore. It's much more complicated. And this wet waste, as it's called, is men's work, not women's work. But it's a massive addition to the work of the municipal sanitation workers and the, the labour that's subcontracted to these private firms for the municipality. Because if they are to recycle what they find in the drains, they've got to clean it before they sort it. So it's a very disgusting addition to um, work. And you can see that there is more that they just give up on and regard as non-recyclable, which goes to the dump yard, than would be the case if it weren't coated in human residues. So the visibility, this is a huge problem and it's physically very obvious if you walk around looking at drains, but politically as yet, it's invisible. Okay, now the last kind of circuit of capital inside the town is capital in the reproduction of society. And I studied alcohol, but I'm not going to talk about it. But alcohol is, is necessary for the reproduction of society, even if society doesn't drink, which it does, because waste workers won't go to work without a drink. And they often drink, as it were, therapeutically to console their bodies and their minds from the disgusting things they have to do during work. But I'm going to talk about medical waste and private clinics um, and tell the story of this lady, uh, although I've talked to dozens of um, housekeepers, they're called housekeepers, nice euphemism. Um, <clears throat> The people who clean and sort the waste in hospitals and clinics, oh, and by the way, I didn't say this, but of course a, health, a society can't reproduce well unless it's healthy, which was why I chose health um, when looking around for a case study for social reproductive work, which is commodified. So um, people working in hospitals and clinics in the waste sector are often illiterate their scheduled caste or scheduled tribe. They learn by doing. Quite a lot of what they have to learn is actually in English. So they have to get some English competence as well as um, doing work, which ranges from all the way from being a theater attendant to doing heavy waste work in um, maternity wards or um, uh, other very op operating theatres, which are um, productive of a lot of medical waste. Um, they all work extremely long hours, and they have all said that this work is practically incompatible with domestic work. So if you do this work, you have to have other labour at home doing the domestic um, household reproductive work. They have oral contracts, and they may have them over 20 years. So they are both permanent labor, but on oral contracts. And in the private medical clinic sector, they do get discretionary perks, but according to loyalty, 
and um, according to the number of years that they have worked. And they get about seven and a half thousand <coughs> rupees a month. No, now Mohan Rao, who's here, knows very well, has worked with Sarah Hodges on all this. Um, medical waste is, is usually thought about as infectious waste, but most medical waste is just general consumption waste. There's just a lot of it. But the infectious waste has, in theory, a separate disposal system with um, uh, uh, separate lorries and carts destined for incineration or for burial. But this is at best porous and at worst, as is the case for this town, it has been closed down because of the pollution caused by the incinerator to the villages that it was located close to. They have protested and the thing has been closed down. So it more or less feeds this infectious waste into the informal and the illegal recycling of medical plastics and metals and there are very big incentives for this part of the waste system to be completely invisible. Here are pictures not mine but from Sarah Hodges who looked at Apollo hospitals in Chenning um, and in the top left picture you can see people taking medical waste off a lorry off a trailer to go into hand carts um, to feed the big economy of um, segregating and recycling for plastic pellets and plastic goods. And you can see it's more, a lot of the labor is female labor. Okay, so those are, that's the end of the, the stories from the case studies. And there are three questions. Do I have time to talk about them? The general. Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. Take another five, ten minutes, and then that would be good too. That, that's good that's to... all I. That's all I need. Um, so, by way of wrapping up, I thought there are some questions, general questions, which arise from the um, experience of talking to these people and looking and learning about this sector. Firstly, how is it regulated? So much of it is informalized. Is it a refuge, as some idealists and um, dissenting economists would like to see a refuge operating with a logic that's different from the regular capitalist urban economy. That's a very interesting question and I have some comments on that. Secondly, how are property ownership and the labour process actually gendered? And with what economic and social consequences? And thirdly, is there any collective activity um, is there any collective resistance to the kinds of arrangements that I've tried to explain? Okay, for the first question, I don't think um, from this fieldwork that the waste economy is either marginal or separate. It seems to me to be integrally part of India's capitalist economy, and it has a similar kind of distribution of assets and forms of organization. Um, Self-employment is very important in the informal economy. Um, the distribution of assets is highly concentrated. There's a monopoly at the top, often it's an oligopoly, but it's, it's not different from any other sector, I think. At least that's my finishing hypothesis. As with the Jeffrey's early work on dung in villages, um, mostly for use um, here, in commodified waste, it does transcend the classifications of productive and reproductive work. But it's not simply um, generating use value, it's generating um, exchange value and it's generating negative values. It's a public bad, um, wrongly treated, it will gum up the urban economy within 24 hours. Um, and also there are experts who talk about it as zero value, uh, as in the category of inert waste. Um, I'm not sure that much of the waste in the town that I studied has zero value. I think it has negative value and some has positive value. It's regulated in very complicated ways um, and the disturbing, if you're studying development, the disturbing feature is the aggressive informalization of the work even though it appears to be being formalized or 
privatized to corporate capital, the labor force is employed under more and more aggressively informalized terms and conditions and earnings everywhere are declining. Um, the modes of regulation involve the formation and the reproduction of classes, including um, the class of self-employed, petty commodity production and trade. Um, modes of regulation are formally state, um, but informally um, organized through locality, gender, caste, and social identity. Talk about gender a little later on. Um, it, caste is hugely important at the bottom of the economic pile. It's naturalized as a Dalit domain. It's actually a field for scheduled tribal people who are differentiated. Irulas are very different from the Arundatyas who have got scheduled tribal certificates. It is cosmopolitanizing, but very slowly. And then it is regulated through human identity, through the capacity to be super exploited and be dehumanized. So there are there is a, a sort of structure of violence in the intersection between waste and caste, especially in the informal book economy, but even in the municipality. So let's just think of that a little bit longer. As an outsider, it seems that people are discriminated against, but they say, the workers say, they are not, they don't discriminate against each other at work, except for the Iralas who are dehumanized. But they do feel discrimination in the contacts that they have during work with the rest of urban society and certainly in their life outside work. This is where discrimination gets to be practiced against them. And what I think they have described is that abuse based on their ascribed status, based on their caste names and caste identities has, has been replaced by discrimination on the basis of individual lack of capabilities. In other words, they will say, it's not because we are pariahs, it's because we're illiterate, we're poor, our work is dirty, we drink alcohol, that people discriminate against us. So the jury's out, but um, this is what I learned from field work. Gender remains a persistent target of patriarchal practices with much lower pay, a lot of name calling and joking, sometimes by upper caste women and much sexual harassment in and out of work. Um, and the paradox that we might see if we want to see it, um, that human waste is now a sphere of humiliation of men um, and not just of women. Property owner ownership and gendering, um, I can deal with very quickly. It's male. Pro all property is male, except perhaps the tiny, tiny to private assets which are needed in order for municipal laborers to perform public work. In other words, it's my broom. I have to pay for my broom. If I want to work with gloves, I have to pay for those gloves. So it's micro, micro assets, which may be the property of women, but all the property that matters, the property that enables the exploitation of labor is owned by men. And the labor, I have no idea, I don't think anyone has any idea of the full size of the labor force in this town involved in waste, but it's likely to be disproportionately feminized. Despite the masculinization of the municipal workforce. And the women are working in couples for the private company, in families and in groups in the informal economy. And they're as likely to be bonded by loans as are men. They tend to be concentrated in the worst, heaviest, dirtiest, manual and menial labor. Um, 
In the division of labor between wet and dry, which I talked about um, when discussing human waste, women have to substitute for men. In other words, if a man is sick or doesn't come in for work, women have to do the wet work. But men do not do the dry work, were it the case that women didn't come in, but that's very rarely talked about. It's women who underpin the group work done by the municipal labor force, and they have no washrooms, no changing rooms. Um, and this labor force is being eased out of their dilapidated housing. So they've got problems with shelter as well as with work. The private, the labor, women labor working for the private companies have no childcare, very, very poor housing for, for migrants, no access to the ration um, and very long shifts and fluid contracts, which depend on discretion and the time you've served. Women's work is strenuous, long shifts, difficult to combine with childcare and household reproductive work. And little to no provision is made in the workplace for the social and biological needs of women. Even in the hospital, for instance, the women have to sneak into lavatories used by patients for their own needs. There's no special place for them. It's as though they had no needs. They had no biological bodies. And yet their work is essential. Secure contracts on decent pay scales with work rights and social security eligibility is being replaced either by sudden or um, incremental, incrementally replaced by ad hoc contracts with a massive drop in pay and sex discrimination appearing where there was equal pay earlier when they were working directly for state institutions. The informal wages vary, as I've shown you in this talk, but they hover around the poverty line. And what this means is that this labor force needs, um, needs subsidized public goods, especially the public distribution system. But that access is imperfect. And the people who are neediest are the most imperfectly entitled to the social safety net and subsidized public goods. That's very clear. Um, so your question will be, why don't they organize? What about the solidary economy? What about collective action? And try as you might, you, and you, you do find it, but you don't find self-help groups which uh, receive a lot of academic attention and publicity, and you don't find NGOs. You do find one trade union, you find caste associations, kinship groups, and a little bit of barter um, uh, Tupperware for, for clothing, that kind of thing, at rates which are customarily set. So these other forms of social organization are mainly small scale and they are multi-purpose and they have all kinds of objectives like better respect, dispute resolution, <coughs> cross-caste marriages, patta, um, land rights and so on and so forth. Many of them don't have a legally respective, respected status and they mesh production and reproduction. So these collective organizations are in a fetal stage if they're growing at all. They certainly aren't in opposition to the capitalist economy but at best they attempt to make it work better in the collective interest but the collective interest is always socially fractured and the many problems of waste workers as waste workers are only represented through their identities as Dalits and Adivasis or schedule caste and schedule tribe. Now Karin Kapadia has suggested that Dalit women have a particular kind of um, expression, collective expression, and it's an imaginative um, idea. She thinks that Dalit women express themselves politically through similar kinds of reactions and similar behavior in individual, not in collective, but individual struggles in everyday work, which bridges work sites and domestic labor. And that is something that does ring bells in the waste economy, that women 
um, devote themselves resourcefully in similar kinds of ways. But that is a very unusual kind of definition of, of uh, collective action. And um, the union, which is cross-caste, um, has a lot of failure, as well as um, some success for waste workers, including um, the municipality actually giving um, a sum of money to an informal unregistered worker who was killed by a tractor trailer a few years back, which resulted in um, a demonstration by C2. So that success is um, a union success, but it's not a success for union members. So although that part of the public sector workforce is closer to decent work than any of the other parts of the waste economy, the logic of commodification, of casualization, contractualization is diffusing throughout the state and certainly prevailing over the logic of public service. So there ain't much solidary economy and women's solidary economy isn't different from anything else. Okay, so the title of the talk, although the clearing of shit is most often done by men in this town, the waste economy seems disproportionately feminized. The entire sector is stigmatized, but it's much more oppressive for women. Women work harder for longer hours um, their lengthened day is interfering with reproductive work and they get lower pay and fewer social entitlements. Most of the livelihoods, the worst tasks, the poorest paid waste work is done by women. So I think that the Jeffrey's invocation of shit work for dung work applies in spades to this town. Last slide. Um, the waste economy is a cultural artifact, and only when the practices and the economy of waste are disengaged from patriarchy and caste and publicly funded and organized. And one of the sanitation workers suggested it needs to be organized just like the Indian Army. And that's really a very different kind of idea from um, the, the self-help group, um, public fee kind of dimension of debates about what is to be done in waste. Only if it's well organized is it likely to be technologically transformed. And meanwhile, it's going to become, if it isn't already, one of India's most obtrusive development problems. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Barbara. Um, that was a an amazing, I, I, when Barbara said when we met before the talk that she had, this was her first, the first time she was putting this together. So we have actually been witness to an amazing, heart-rending um, presentation on an issue we all live with, um, but haven't actually uh, grappled with in the, and certainly not in the comprehensive way in which you have done this today. I. I'm quite, quite overwhelmed actually by what you have achieved. Um, it's now open for discussion, for questions, for comments. Um, please, uh, if you have a question, I would suggest that you unmute yourself and open your video and ask it yourself. Uh, otherwise, if you feel you can't do that, uh, put it in the chat box for, for us to take a look at. Barbara, I'm curious about the health implications of waste work. What are the kinds of occupational diseases uh, do they suffer from? Other than, of course, alcoholism is, uh, is something that you raised. Uh, what would be the, you know, malnutrition would be extremely prevalent in this population. Maternal mortality rates would be very high. But given the nature of the waste economy, the public also pays a huge price for it in the sense that, for instance, there are 20,000 deaths due to rabies in India every year. And that is a consequence of very poor management of the waste economy. 
Now, do you have any idea of anybody at all has costed these? What, what price do we pay for not doing a better job of managing waste? Mohan, this is a really um, good and hard question. Thank you very much. Um, I am not sure that the zoonotic transfers from uh, the waste substances to urban society have been costed. Um, but you're very right that, that there are immediate health consequences to the labor force. And then there are wider health, public health consequences to urban society. Um, I'm not a doctor, but waste workers, I did ask about occupation related diseases and accidents. And of course, standing on a syringe, which I very nearly did on two occasions, once in the scrapyard and once on the dump yard. Um, so I know that the system is not segregated. It's not separate. Um, so there's a, an exposure to infectious disease and then occupation related diseases, um, upper respiratory tract infections from the noxious air in which they work, skin irritations and infections because of walking around in the monsoon as well as the heat. Um, uh, urinary tract infections because of holding urine in, not being able to pee properly. This bodily control that many of the workers described because of lack of facilities. Um, and then as you said, alcoholism and alcohol consumption is very common and quite large chunks of that, those monthly earnings that I calculated goes on alcohol. Um, the municipal sanitation workers knew the statistic quoted in the Human Rights Watch report on manual scavenging in 2014, that 90% of municipal sanitation workers die before the age of retirement, 90%. And the, the age of retirement is 58. So there is a huge health toll on malnutrition, I can't comment. Um, the people in the informal economy are very thin. The municipal sanitation workers are not so thin. Um, yeah, so the, the combination of contempt and neglect and subcontracting does suggest that many of the officials um, understand that the neglect of waste is a, is a risk to public health in the town. But it's one thing to know that, and it's another thing to be in a position to do something about it. I think it requires a lot more resources than, so we could say that they have to sort out caste first and they have to sort out tax evasion, and then they can sort out waste. Thank you, Barbara. There's a question in the chat box from Ratna Sudarshan oh. saying, thank you, Barbara, the rice mills that you showed us, is there any possibility or interest in their contributing to the management of waste, what they produce and beyond? Thank you, Ratna. Um, Ratna and I worked on rice milling in the early part of the 21st century. Um, I don't think the rice millers are at all different from any other uh, member of the business class in this town. Why should they be? Um, most of this class has a right to throw waste. Um, it's a general right that they will throw out husk and then they will throw out their consumption waste when they go home. Um, Valerian Rodriguez wrote about this in um, Go, Gopal Guru's book on humiliation, published in 2009. Um, he made a very powerful and moving statement to the effect that India is divided between waste throwing and waste collecting. 
costs. And that until this is addressed as a cost problem, um, nothing is going to be done and nothing has been done, nothing very much. So I wish I could say go and organize the rice millers, but I don't think it will make a jot of difference. So Barbara, I was just wondering, sorry, Mary, can I just uh, take Absolutely. a moment? Yes, yes. Um, just simply because the rice mills looked really very technologically advanced. So I was wondering whether, you know, is there any CSR contribution that they have to make? And I mean, just, just a question. I was wondering whether, what well, do they do with their 2% CSR? Well, I, I didn't show you the liquor factory because it was closed, but that looks quite technologically advanced as well but it's actually run in a political nexus of corruption. And, um, and as you saw from the photograph, the effluent from liquor production is really very toxic and has spread all over Dalit land and ruined it. So I don't think that these companies are actually big enough. I don't know what the threshold is for corporate social responsibility obligations. Um, it will be interesting to know. I did talk to the president of the Chamber of Commerce and trade association presidents. They really aren't concerned as they're not bothered about waste. So there's a deep problem of sensitization and education to go on. And I suppose what I'm trying to say, this is not a caste problem of low caste, although low castes are naturalized as the labor for this sector. It's actually a problem of high caste who feel a right to throw waste and who don't see it, for whom the substances are invisibilized. Um, uh, oh, yes. Uh, thank you very much for a very enlightening talk, uh, Barbara. Um, I think your focus on small town on a small town uh, is something which I have also been thinking about in other contexts. And uh, really that's where the crisis that we are facing becomes most stark, uh, you know, for various reasons. I mean, reasons of um, how gender relations uh, work across social strata, uh, reasons of the lower resources of the municipality as compared to uh, the resources available in, in uh, a city like Bombay. Uh, and then the way that caste operates, uh, you know, which is different from what it would be in a village and the slight dissipation of the star kind of caste things that you have uh, in, a, in a bigger, uh, uh, urban uh, uh, environment. And so, you know, you come up when you talk about this contempt and neglect, uh, they, they, they work very strongly in, in this small town kind of environment. I was interested by uh, Mohan Rao's question because we must think about, you know, what, how can we make people more aware of this? And you're very right in saying that, you know, it is an upper class problem. It, it is not just the horrible conditions in which Dalits and Adivasis, and of course, the, I don't know how the nomadic tribes figure in all this uh, uh, have, to, have to work, but also, you know, keep your home clean and holy uh, kind of attitude of the upper castes. Uh, it's not a question, I'm just uh, expressing the, the thoughts that uh, you, you, you gave rise to, you know, but, uh, I think small towns and in a state like Maharashtra, of course, the urbanization has gone very far. I think this is one of the places we really have to focus our research now. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much for supporting the idea of small towns being interesting. They're also very, very important. There are thousands upon thousands of them in India. Um, yes. And drawing attention to the links between public finance and caste. Um, and your comments raise 
general points about which the Jeffreys were raising about binaries and terms in development studies. Um, and what we so often do is devote ourselves to a sector which is labeled, which has a labeled policy field, right? And some of the solutions to the problems that we find involve rethinking that, yeah? So waste as a problem of caste, waste as a problem of public finance, public finance being a problem of tax evasion and of um, a non-compliant society. How? <laughs> so we can tinker, we can ask for better state funding, but uh, we don't address the preconditions that need to be in place for something to work in the way that we intend. And, that, and so that I, come out of this fieldwork, and I won't be going back to it, I don't think. Um, feeling that policy studies uh, need to, um, need to mainstream two questions in everything that is discussed, not just waste everything. One, are, one is what are the institutional preconditions for which this good idea I have for policy would need to be in place for it to work as I would like it to work. And the second question is, who is the enemy? What is the obstacle? And having identified the enemy, every single policy will have enemies. How do I buy it off, ignore, um, bypass, uh, destroy that opposition or those enemies? And we really need to think of waste in those terms, what needs to be in place? Yes, we need to have upper caste consciousness and willingness to segregate um, at home. In the town that I've been studying in the last year, um, no, I'm sorry, last year, no, 2019, um, they have started to employ a cadre of Dalit women called animators. So they're educated Dalit women and they're going around the houses of the town saying, um, you must segregate your waste, yes? And people listen and they nod and then they <laughs> don't segregate their waste. Why don't they segregate their waste? Have they got room in their kitchens? What happens, who takes it out if it is in different buckets? Where does it go in the street if it's in different buckets? The whole thing hasn't been thought through. So they're starting paying people to do something. They know that segregation is a terrible problem. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the solution. The, 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 the solution is a very complicated thing. The obstacles are to do with architecture. They're to do with mentality. To do with domestic technology. All kinds of things. And we need to think systemically when we are thinking about waste, not just knee-jerk responses. So often the case, self-help groups, user fees, segregation. Da 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 da. da. Doesn't work. Um, thanks, Vandana. There are two questions in the chat box, Barbara. One is by one of our students, Rohini Tyagi, who worked on this, on this in, in Delhi. And she asks, she says, very interesting presentation, ma'am. I want to know whether there is interstate migrant labor in waste work in your field sites. Yes, there is. Um, and it's um, a, a terrible problem. Um, because interstate migrant labor doesn't have local language, they don't learn Tamil, they don't have accommodation, they were living in these shacks, I showed some photos. So they're very isolated and vulnerable. They're brought, um, they're not migrating in gangs, they're brought by companies who go and use contractors to sweep up labor. For instance, in this town, some of the labor is on the um, Karnataka Maharashtra border destitute agricultural labor brought to this town, living in slums on the edge of town with no facilities, no facilities and no schooling for kids or anything. Um, so yes, there is, as it were, formal migrant labor, bonded labor in these big, bigger private companies that win these bidding competitions for a third of the wards of the town. Then there's another kind of migrant labor. There are transients. You could even call the Irulas transient because they're constantly being evicted. 
they used to live in the center of town on a hill and that's a rather nice place and they've been encroached on and pushed out and there's a few left and most of them are living in forests in protected land so they don't have right to homes and at any point the police or the collector can come and evict them so they're migrants in a in another way transient and then there's another category of labor that works in the waste economy that has forfeited the right to be dependent what do i mean well cross-caste marriages certain kinds of diseases um criminal behavior the, the family and the village of origin no longer feel um, the obligation to support them. So they live a, a life of constant migration um, and they can find work in the waste economy. And why do the police not turf them out? Because they know that this labor is important to the cleanliness of the town. So there's a lot of migrant labor, but it's not very visible. Um. Smita Jassal has a question for you. Thank you, Barbara. Very disturbing, harrowing, thought-provoking. Your insights about alcohol consumption for consoling, so understandable. Don't you think all this hype about frontline workers with COVID could be used at this time to bring greater visibility to this huge problem? Smita, that's a very good suggestion, but I would throw it back to you. If it hasn't already done this, why not? If it hasn't given greater visibility um, to waste workers during the pandemic, when they're, they're dealing with a lot of infectious waste um, and very much more dangerous working conditions, if, if, it, if they haven't been recognized, then when are they going to be recognized? Please write about it. Please shout about it. This is what um, I mean, the implications of, of my last slide, it should be organized like the Indian Army, which was not a, a suggestion in jest. It was a very serious conclusion of um, one of the leading women municipal sanitation workers. Um, if this isn't the right moment to, to ask for a step change in the way in which it's funded, and organized and respected, then I don't know what is. Thank you for the comment. Uh, I think there's another message that's coming through. It might take a little while. Uh, I had a very sort of, I don't know, actually I have really not thought about this at all, but to me the profound irony seems to be you know, you began by saying that we, we started out not so long ago as being predominantly producing biodegradable waste. And that would have corresponded to a time when the municipal structure was more formal, I would think, with better wages. And now we've shifted to this moment of this ballooning uh, production of, of all, the, all the stuff that you've, 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 uh, you've described for us. And it's uh, informalization. So, so at a time when, in fact, it was much more hip, it was much, I would imagine, more possible to manage, in fact, the cleaning of our towns and cities through the through this creation of the municipal sweeper and worker and cleaner. If I'm right, I don't know if I'm right about that. Uh, we now have shifted to a time when it's being informalized precisely when it's going out of complete control. Am, am I right? Uh, or, you know, this is a very crude response to what you've described. Mary, I think that that's what I'm trying to suggest is the starting hypothesis coming from this research, that we should assume that. Um, it's tempting to think of a golden age when waste workers were respected. And of course, we know that in, those, in that era, there was a lot of um, manual scavenging. Yeah, that, that, that yes, it was biodegradable. Um, yes, it was collected, and, and um, I remember it in Ardney in 1973. There were huge pits around the edge of town, which are composting pits, and they were auctioned every year, and you would see the piles of compost on the fields in the villages surrounding the town. That's how it worked, and it's, it's actually under the decades seeing how it's stopped working that made me very interested in making a leap from agricultural food to looking at 
this metabolic rift. Yeah. So there's a way in which the waste of the time was recycled and and uh, returned to the soil, but that isn't happening anymore. It can't happen. Right. It's impossible to do it. There's a question that I think came from the YouTube side uh, from Satish Deshpande. Has oh. the value of waste increased over time as more and more types of waste are monetized? And if so, could we hope for some trickle down effects for workers? Um, the answer to that question is yes, it has increased hugely, the, the value of waste as raw material. In other words, the free goods collected, which you sell, um, trickle down to workers, um, less likely. And the reason is that it's a sector which is stigmatized, but is easy to enter. So there'll be a constant flow of people who can't get other work, who enter yeah. the workforce and um, compete. W what we're seeing is not the tightening of earnings or the raising of earnings with this enormous expansion in volume and in value of waste as recyclable raw material. We're seeing the opposite. And um, as long as people, as long as it's a sector um, which can absorb people without alternative jobs, then you won't get that trickle down, that tightening of the labor market or the earnings that um, you might expect from economic theory. Um, if I may follow up on that, you mentioned, I think in the early stage, somewhere along the way about this idea that there's this informal world that's separate from the formal uh, or that's outside of capitalism, you know, the Kalyan Sanyal or other kinds of ideas, mm -hmm. parts of Now, on the one hand, it's very clear that that's a clear no because of the way in which you've shown it as being precisely out. But on the other hand, what you said just now, the fact that there is this constant supply or available supply of those who have nowhere else, who, who are thrown up in whatever shape or form, displaced by whatever processes and end up then, you know, feeding and, and, and preventing any way in which uh, real benefits could ever come to them. Isn't that a more complicated kind of set of relationships uh, between the workers and their histories and the, the production of waste coming out of capitalist um, you know, worlds? I don't know, I'm not being very coherent here, but... Uh, um, you're ask, it's a really interesting question um, because in a way it assumes that there is pure capitalism, right? There's something, really, and I have spent nearly, well, I have spent 50 years in the field in India and I see no pure capitalism. So it, whether you're looking at waste or whether you're looking at rice or um, whether you're looking at silk, um, all systems of production um, are structured and regulated through the state, but also through aspects of social identity. So it works in this way in waste. And what I'm saying is that I don't think that makes it non-capitalist. And I do disagree that there's such a thing as a needs economy working with a different logic. Um, there is subsistence, yes. Um, and we, what's interesting is the extent to which subsistence production requires monetary inputs, um, which are got from other occupations in a family portfolio. Um, but that subsistence production then is bolted into the capitalist economy through the need for subsidies and cash inputs. Um, and I don't see the non-corporate economy, which was what Kalyan San Sanyal um, used to define the needs economy as actually, it's, I mean, that is the economy that I've been studying for the last 50 years and it is capitalist. Yes. So there are two points. I think there's, you know, can we ignore as non-capitalist parts of the economy which are actually working heavily instituted and institutionally regu regulated and not regulated by the state, but working according to a similar kind of logic? Mm -hmm. And is there any pure capitalism? No. People who study the city of London say it's absolutely full of social relations even sort of advanced country finance capital. 
Sure. Sure. So we have cap pure capitalism model to help us think. Yeah, very important to help us think. And then we have capitalism on the ground, which is always socially embedded in my understanding. Um, can we take the last question, which is actually pulling us away a little to um, from Rajesh Ramakrishnan saying, what has been the historical trajectory of waste work in third world countries without a caste system? You're being asked um, to sort of look at comparisons. This is something that I know less about, um, but, but I know where the answer is. It's on the website of WIGO, W-I-E-G-O, um, Women in the Informal Economy Globalizing and Organizing. They have um, a section devoted to um, waste in developing countries. And I th a very crude reaction to the question is that, um, and I'm more familiar with work in Pakistan, where it is Christians who do this work, um, that it's almost always of low social status. Almost always, whether it's well done, well funded um, or not. It's, and, and in the States, it's the, the waste labor force is almost completely a black lab, labor force. Um, so I, I think that the, it, it's not a matter of developing countries, it's a matter of the stigma um, attached to the substances which people deal with. Um, and then the real differences are how well it's organized and how well people are paid for this work. So in Britain, um, a rubbish worker doesn't have high status, although I think many people do respect them and do understand what they what work they do, but they're not the poorest paid in the public sector, in the un, in the poorer skilled part of the public sector. Mm -hmm. I think last last question from <laughs> Nancy Narayanan. Uh, thank you for this very interesting presentation. There are huge parallels with the waste workers in Kerala, despite organisations as Harita Karma Sena or the Green Army with some support. The structural exploitation has remained the same. The ambition to quickly make them waste entrepreneurs has not materialized. In a couple of municipalities, it has worked with substantial improvement in returns, and then mentions that there's a master's thesis on this from IIT Bombay. Thank you very much for that contribution. Um, I do think that we need a whole generation of decentralized studies and case material, and that um, we respect the problems of municipal, local government. Local government is a very low status policy area to study, but it's the key um, to improvements in waste. And thank you for the details about Kerala. There's one more. Hello? I think Vasanti had her finger up. Okay, I'm sorry, I lost the connection for a while there. So uh, I missed I missed your response, but okay, Vasanti, will you, I, I'm saying now, okay, this is the last one. <laughs> Well, Barbara, please have a, have a thought for Barbara, who's been with us. Yeah, no, I just wanted to take up this question of municipal self-government, because about four, five years ago or so, the Ministry of Rural Development in India had been conducting a survey in different states. And one of the issues that had been taken up there as part of the, the village local self-government uh, development was the whole question, among other things, was the whole question of solid and liquid waste management. And now in the context of that, a whole lot of when some of us were involved in the discussion, very, very interesting questions came up from young village level workers who are part of this team. So in, in a sense, I think central to this whole thing would be an emphasis on decentralization and various forms of local self-government, I think. That's all, I don't have 
in more to say on this. May I may I respond to that, Mary? Of course, please. It's it's your um, call here. You're the one who's must be exhausted. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not exhausted. I feel very inspired by these responses. Um, in my study of the town, I had to go out into villages for various purposes. And of course, sensitized to consumption waste, I saw that consumption waste is building up in villages as well. Um, waste planners who think that it's all lovely and organic and it goes into pits and is recycled. It's wrong because villages have the same consumption patterns as people with the same incomes in, in towns. They have metropolitan aspirations in terms of consumption and therefore they create the same kind of waste. So um, it's a very big problem for panchayats, for panchayat government. And um, it, so I agree that uh, at some level um, there needs to be some realistic thought about what can be decentralized. But I'm hesitant because um, it's not clear to me that every village should have a dump yard. Are you with me? That, the, 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 in other words, or, or, or every village should have a micro incinerator. Um, there are some technologies of waste disposal that I think need to be more deep, more centralized than others. But these are very interesting questions and I'm not sure where they're being discussed. Um, and the, the, the idea of um, descaling technology, um, making technologies appropriate to rural locations, as well as um, urban, very, very narrow alleys and urban back streets where you can't get a lorry and you can't get a tractor trailer in. You've got to descale technologies, um, which in New Delhi may sound ridiculous, but nothing is going to be sorted unless these kinds of questions are being asked. So Vasanti, thank you very much for that comment. And um, I mean, it, it just it opens a complete sort of Pandora's box of problems um, about the capacity of panchayats to deal with um, contemporary composition of waste. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, Barbara, I, I will now say thank you on behalf of all of us. It's been an amazing afternoon for us uh, and it must be heading for lunchtime for you. Um, it's been really a, a marvelous uh, presentation and you've opened up areas that we sense and half know but hardly know. So um, thank you and thank you all for staying with us. Uh, um, Vanita adds her voice. Vanita Mukherjee, thank you for a brilliant and moving presentation. Th thank you very much for inviting me and um, do get in touch with me yes. if you would like to know more about this project because yes. I have written quite a lot about it um, and this is the first time I've really put all the fieldwork on women together so thank you very very much for this opportunity. Okay. Thank you Barbara. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Goodbye everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye.